names that came to our mind was uh, Aydin Bouluc for his recent work uh, on sparsity, as he will explain now. So Aydin uh, is actually coming from Turkey, so he was a, a student at Kesbe uh, University, which is the place where CASC will be held uh, later this uh, August. I think you, ha you have a, a, a little map. You do? Yeah, please. <laughs> oh, it's yes. actually a little different. Um, let me see if this works. Why don't you work? So I actually was a student, not there, but in Sabanji University right over here, but I'm just, this is the same neighborhood. Thank you so much. And, and you can see how far it is from the city center as well as the airport, it's all the way up there. Okay. So make sure you have enough time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you moved to Berkeley for your master and, and your PhD. So you got your PhD in? Uh, I got my PhD in Santa Barbara, in, down in California, okay. at the sunnier spot of California. Uh, but I've been in Berkeley for the last 12 years. Yeah. And yes, now at the uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Lab. Okay, well, thank you so much for accepting this invitation because this is a big trip. Especially in fun. those challenging times, we are so happy to have you here. And we know we extracted you from your holidays in Turkey. Actually, you went back home and, and came back to the old world. So thanks again. Looking thank forward to your presentation. Thank you, Please, Mark. The is yours. Thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be in Europe in the summer. Um, I actually dislike the 4th of July noise in the United States. And this is, uh, it, you know, keeps my dog a little anxious, unnecessarily so. Um, we already got, went through the maps. Um, this is a picture from a, the building I work at. And there you can see both the campus, UC Berkeley campus, which is right under Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and um, the San Francisco Bay on the left bottom corner there. It's a pretty nice area. Um, but let's, okay, this is gonna be a little exciting. Let me see if I can work like this, perfect. It looks like my directions work. So I'm gonna talk about sparse matrices. Um, I'm actually not gonna talk a lot about numerical uh, computing. Uh, my career has been to sell sparse matrix technology to people who do data analytics, machine learning, and so on. So um, this is the research agenda of my little research group. So we do new uh, research on uh, applications where we find patterns, computational patterns that repeatedly happen, genomics, um, graph analysis, protein data analysis, machine learning, and I'm gonna cover pretty much all of those today. Um, we do research on new data structures and algorithms uh, on how to map those sparse matrix primitives onto modern architectures as efficiently as possible. Um, we do actually have a, you know, international collaboration called Graph Plus, which is to um, which started as something uh, as simple as how do we do graph algorithms in the language of matrices and linear algebra, and evolved into something um, a little bit more, more powerful, and its application domain has expanded beyond just graphs since then. And we do a lot of parallel computing research. Um, the uh, Department of Energy ec ecosystem um, favors large-scale computing uh, in the sense that it actually goes back to the roots of the original U.S. National Lab system where um, the whole purpose of the laboratory was to attack problems bigger than those that can be solved by single PIs at universities. So it was team science, big science, um, dream big and try to solve as big problems as possible. And it still lives on and that kind of leads us to large scale computing. We do actually have a supercomputer uh, sitting right under that building that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, right now ranked number five in the world, I think. Uh, but that, that is such a fast-changing number that I don't keep track of a lot. Um, so these, are, oh, you can learn more about that at uh, passion.lbl, that's the, um, the name of the group that stands for Parallel Al uh, Algorithms for Sparse Computations, I think. Um, these are the kind of people I do have um, main appointment at laboratory 
and uh, yeah, an adjunct faculty appointment at UC Berkeley. So that gives me the opportunity to get postdoctoral fellows at the lab and students at the university. Um, this was the snapshot of those students. I think since then we graduated one last month and got a new one, but um, I think this is still a fairly accurate in time picture that I will keep it that way. And now I can get to the technical part of the, the talk. So you probably heard about sparse matrices all, all over the place, but I, I like this quote from Harry Markovich, who is the only person who's probably done meaningful work in sparse matrices and got a Nobel Prize. Um, well, basically he said half a century ago or more that um, I observed that most of the coefficients in our matrices are zero. And then he continues, I'm not gonna read all of that, that if you take care when you're doing Gerson elimination, they stay that way, uh, which you know, created a lot of research in, um, in the field of sparse so-called direct solvers, which is literally the whole process of given a system of linear equations represented in a matrix, sparse matrix form A, how can I factor it into L and U so that I can then just quickly solve it using triangular solves? And in that process, how can I make sure that the sparsity in L and U is as close to the original sparsity? Meaning I don't get as a lot of those red dots. Each dot is a non-zero here, right? And the red ones are just, you eliminate variables, you get this fill. And there is, you know, books and books of worth of really fascinating research there. That is actually primarily uh, using graph theory in the background, where you, um, it goes back to my academic grandfather's Robert Tarjan's work where how can you eliminate variables with the least amount of fill from early 70s, I suppose. Um, but my research is actually the opposite direction, which is how can sparse matrices help graph algorithms as opposed to how can graph theory help sparse matrix computations. So the high level outline will be, um, I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on graph algorithms first and I'm gonna go slow and tutorial style. Um, hopefully you're gonna be on the um, flow zone as opposed to the boredom zone. We'll see how that goes. Um, I do have um, a couple of case studies. I'm not gonna go uh, do the last one because I think it's repetitive and unnecessarily complex for someone who's just are following it in a conference. Um, so why does anyone wanna deal with large scale graphs in um, in scientific computing, uh, because we generally do scient so-called scientific computing, meaning I'm using the word as doing computing for science, for helping computational chemistry folks, hel helping computational biology folks, computational physics folks, the, the original reason why supercomputers were built. Um, so this is one example I like, which is another system of sparse linear equations where um, you want to do the same thing, which is, um, Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting, except that when you realize that um, you need to do pivoting on large-scale supercomputers, which is what the stuff you use, it's very expensive to determine which variable to pivot on and replace, uh, reorder those rows in real time, uh, and you've got to do that for every single row. Find the largest element in the particular column, pivot it, and that's gonna create what's called a long critical path, which will uh, you know, limit your scalability. So instead, in practice, what my colleagues do is to pre-permit this matrix into a form where the diagonal has as heavy elements as possible. Um, and the way you solve this problem in graph linear, uh, theory form is um, create a bipartite graph where the rows are on one side of the graph, columns are on the one side, and you find a perfect matching with the highest weight possible. And that way, you'll get the diagonal with the highest weight possible. And there's quite a lot of cool research um, on this as well. So imagine that your problem was large scale. Um, and of course, the graph you problem you have to solve here is large scale. I mean, um, in fact, we actually attacked this problem because this has been a, a bottleneck for a long time. Uh, even though all the solvers have advanced to a state where it was running on tens of um, thousands of processors. This process of finding the um, heavyweight matching was run sequentially using a code written by Ian Duff's group in uh, UK, however uh, many decades ago. And of course it was creating significant bottlenecks uh, if it was running at all. 
if the problem was large enough, it wasn't. And um, we, have, we had a nice um, algorithm, I'm not actually have a reference here, that got published two years ago, I think it's SIAM um, Journal of Scientific Computing. And then the perennial problem in uh, parallel computing is how do I decompose my problem into pieces so they can run with minimal communication on each processor. And a lot of the times this boils down into a graph partitioning thing. You represent your problem as a graph and the dependencies and the communication as the edges on that graph. And you now need, you need to solve the graph partitioning problem for simultaneously load balancing and minimizing communication. And the list actually goes on and on and it gets a little boring after a while. Um, so machine learning problems have subroutines that are graph problems. Um, the, the thing that I'm gonna explain later in the second part of the talk, which is a genome assembly problem, um, is actually solved with a graph abstraction, with actually multiple graph abstraction depending on the input case. Um, you can do analysis of your um, brain in regions of interest or higher resolution pieces with graphs. So this, the, the motivations are plentiful. In fact, the question becomes, why would anyone want to use sparse matrices in the first place? When we started this research, when I started this research, I think in, when I was a grad student in 2006, um, there was no parallel systems for graph algorithms that were scalable. I think the, the, the only thing that attacked this area was parallel version of the boost graph library and it stopped uh, scaling, meaning getting faster after as small as eight processors or something. And the main reason that was happening is because you take an algorithm listed in your textbook, your favorite computer science textbook, and you try to execute it in parallel by line by line parallelizing those operations, um, you get this computation that is extremely data driven and latency bound, meaning the, the time to access that data is limiting your uh, time. And lots of unstructured irregular accesses. Once you map this thing into sparse matrix terms, you're working in blocks of data, you can reorder, you can reorganize, and you can predict when communication is gonna happen, when computation is gonna happen, so you can overlap them. And so that gives you a lot of freedom to, to do a lot of um, optimizations. And a you know, small picture of some of the most important operations we use, and I'm gonna go over them by example, are these really multiplication of two sparse matrices, multiplication of a sparse matrix with a sparse vector, um, element-wise things, and extracting um, sub-matrices. These are really not the primitives that numerical linear algebra have focused on at all. For numerical linear algebra, the things are really dense matrix multiplications and sparse matrix dense vector computation. The first one, um, the second one is for iterative methods. The first one is uh, solving dense uh, systems in any way. And uh, the direct solvers mecha mechanism is very complex and it doesn't map well to a lot of the primitives. So I like this quote by one of the founders of numerical linear algebra, Charlie Van Leeuwen. He basically said at some point is our mission is to build a linear algebra sense to the extent that vector level thinking becomes as natural as scalar level thinking. Most researchers in this field know that. They don't think about scalars and uh, elements and matrices. They do think about blocks or columns. Uh, in general, they, the, the higher level you can think, the, the more productive it gets. And we would like to do the same for graphs and that's what the whole ar argument behind matrices. So there is one thing that makes uh, graph computations a little, uh, maybe interesting to you, uh, slightly surprising for people in numerical linear algebra, it is that it rarely involves floating point algebra, right? Um, it involves operations on integers um, or booleans or in fact pairs of um, integers that um, one of the elements will say the ID of the vertex, the other one will say the degree of the vertex, and the algorithm will utilize this information to make decisions. And so, so the abstraction we have for this is actually a semi-ring, which is, uh, you know, um, a ring without inverses. Um, and different graph algorithms uh, use different kinds of semi-rings. Now, I'm gonna use the word graph plus semi-ring sometimes so that the mathematicians doesn't attack me. 
um, because even if it's not a semi-ring, it actually works fine in many cases. What does that mean? Um, as long as the operation is associative, uh, even if it doesn't support the rest of the semi-ring um, rules, it actually uh, computes to be okay. And I've likened this to what people do in machine learning. Right? The, the function is not differentiable the way they implement it, but it's okay because the computer code that approximate that doesn't really require differentiability in a mathematical sense. Um, so, but we still use the word semi-ring because it's something that people can Google and get familiar and somehow approximate the definition. And this is just a little bit of a list. For the purposes, I usually say when I need to explain semi-rings to someone not really uh, in the field of uh, uh, mathematics is hey, just think about the ability to overload your addition, multiplication, and identity operation. And that's going to be good enough for the purposes of what we're going to do. So, um, so there's this graph blasting that I haven't explained, except for in my introduction, that that's an international effort to create uh, a set of standard building blocks for doing graph algorithms in the language of linear algebra. And this is a little bit of a map of different graph computations, like traversals, connectivity, um, the centrality computations, which find important uh, entities in a graph, clustering based on gra uh, graph uh, traversals, like Markov cluster algorithm that I'm going to talk a little bit, various path computations, um, shortest paths. In fact, I just said shortest paths, but in general, any path, reliable paths, so on, um, and how they map to various different sparse matrix primitives. And I'm going to give algorithms uh, for some of these primitives that we have developed, um, the ones that are at the bottom. And these are kind of sorted with increasing arithmetic intensity, meaning there's more opportunities for optimization as you go to the right at the bottom. Uh, there's not much you can do, for example, when all you have is a sparse matrix and a single sparse vector, but you can do a lot uh, more magic using high-performance computing tricks when, you, when your right-hand side is a dense matrix, for example. So it all started with a, a colleague of mine, really fun person to hang out, Tim Matson at Intel. He's still at Intel. When he gathered a bunch of people to write a, literally a single page um, uh, paper to state that we want to do this job. Um, there's not much other than the abstract in there, uh, but a lot of people's names. But it kick-started the effort, and it worked very well. And I, when I look back at it, I see that we could have done this work in five times faster speed if we had a smaller group of people, but it wouldn't have any impact. So in some sense, I think I'm happy with this gruesome discussion about the same topic over and over again every other week that we're holding because uh, it actually gets buy-in from people and then more people actually develop things and um, be part of it. So I don't know who this code is from because the internet doesn't actually answer this. Um, it's been attributed to many people. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, so that's kind of how I justify my effort in this. Um, so the API in GraphPlus looks like the following. You have a function um, that's, uh, this is C, unfortunately. We do have Python interfaces. It's going to make your life easier. We didn't want to start with C++ because people started arguing a lot about how much templates you want to use, how much generics they want to use. You, you know this business. Um, in C, there's usually one way to do it, right? In C++, there's 25 uh, and increasing. Um, so uh, there is an output matrix. The, the, what is interesting from a, a perspective of someone who does you know, numerical computation here is that there is a semi-ring, which is the thing that I explained. Uh, we have we formalized it in the language. There's an addition, there's a multiplication, there's certain rules it needs to follow. There is an identity. Um, uh, additive identity, and there is a mask, which is one of my favorite objects there, um, which tells you that some parts of the output might be irrelevant, and the algorithm doesn't need to compute them, and it gets very powerful, and I'm going to talk about that a little later. Then a, quite, quite a bit of other things that tells you whether the, the mask needs to be a yes mask or a no mask, meaning does it tell you what parts of it needs to be computed, or does it tell you what parts of it shouldn't be computed? Um, 
instead of tr explicitly complementing it, this is much more efficient. Everything here is designed for efficiency in, in a C++ sense, uh, meaning don't create overhead. So, so I'm going to start with the first pattern, which is um, sparse matrix times sparse vectors. And the, again, the signature looks like this. There is an output vector. Um, there is a mask, which is the parent's one. It's going to become apparent why it is the mask. Uh, and I'm going to um, go over this one by one so there's no confusion. Um, here's how you do breadth first search in the language of matrices. You have this, what I call, what I used to think is a famous seven vertex graph because this, is, this happens in um, a book titled Graph Algorithms in the Linear Language of Linear Algebra by Jeremy Kepner and John Gilbert. And apparently it goes another 25 years um, back. Um, and that's the adjacency matrix that represents this graph in sparse format. I usually use the transpose because I like to represent my vectors in column format, but you can just use the rows as well. Um, then you would be using the original graph. So let's say I start breadth first search with vertex one. All I have to do in the language of matrices is I multiply um, the A transpose with this X vector with a single entry because that's my starting point. Once I do one multiplication, I find one hop neighbors of breadth first search. Well, um, well, that's good. I also mark them with, the, uh, with the, where they come from. So the way this addition and multiplication works is multiplication just propagates the value of the vector. So it returns the second operand. And the addition, at the moment is not used, will choose the minimum to create a deterministic execution, which is not necessary for a bare first search. It's going to be correct even if it's not deterministic. But I, you know, I like to be able to verify my result uh, sometimes. Um, so this is not necessarily a semiotic, but it is good for our purposes. It's, uh, so that's a good example. Um, and then I'll keep doing this thing. Right before the multiplication, I'm going to set my indices, uh, the values to be indices. So all the values on the vector, right-hand side vector, will be the indices. When I do it again, so I can use a couple of things now. One thing I use is that there are two different ways to reach vertex 7. I can reach vertex 7 from 2, and I can reach vertex 7 from 4. And you can see that from the last row, right? And the fact that the addition is using minimum means the 2 will be propagated. And all that information is just something that's required in many algorithms that do bread for search, which is marking the parents. Where did I come from? So, and I keep track of that where did I come from information in this vector called parents uh, on, the on the left bottom side of the figure. But the interesting thing about that vector is it's not just marking my output. I'm also using that at every iteration as my mask. Because once I get a vertex added into my parent's array, then I don't need to rediscover that vertex again. I'm done, right? But in many cases, the algorithm will pine, find paths back to the vertices that has been discovered already. So the whole point of the parent's array to tell the algorithm, this is done, please don't discover them again. And you would think that it only is a minor optimization. But um, that's not really true. So here, one vertex has been eliminated. I'm just marking this with this silly soccer ball or football. Welcome to the real word, um, the, the thing. Um, and that just tells you what things are masked out. But as I get towards the end of my graph, fewer and fewer vertices left, um, that a lot of things will be masked out, right? The, all these things that I discovered in the last column are previously discovered because seven has a lot of back edges to all the things that is discovered. So uh, why would I discover them again? And okay, how does the algorithm, so I delegated all my work to this function called MXV, which is matrix vector product with a mask and mask is the parents. Does it actually do anything useful? And just delegating the work to another function, does it actually solve my problem? This actually is an interesting story. Um, I thought there was no way to do a masked, an efficient masked uh, multiplication of a sparse matrix with a sparse vector. And I could see some good use cases which are like, well, we can just kind of check the mask and make sure that I don't create the output so it saves memory and um, I can maybe uh, 
but there doesn't seem to be a asymptotically important thing that was going on in there. So our vision was a little limited. But I said, well, the output size and the temporary size is important, so let's include this in the standard and see if we can do something useful with it. Um, and one of my PhD students, um, who I was co-advising, um, he was at UC Davis, Carl convinced me that um, he can do better than just eliminating temporaries with this masked sparse matrix vector multiply. So this is a long story. Um, there is a, a, don't worry about a lot of the text. Let me explain this in, in actually use this board for once. And let's say you start with a breadth first search on a graph and then it will expand. It generally will get larger, right? The, this is the so-called frontier. This is the current level we are at. And after a while, because the graph has not a lot of pieces left, it will start shrinking, right? And let's say there's only a few vertices left, and there'll be a lot of these edges going towards the end of the graph, right? So let's say this is your starting place. This is, these are the end. At this point, you're doing a lot of unnecessary traversals. You're basically saying, I'm going to try to grab this vertex, and some other vertex is trying to grab that vertex. You have a bunch of side edges all over. You might even have back edges. So you'll find, if you analyze in real graphs with so-called small world phenomena, power law degree, very different names being applied, that towards the end of the computation, that 95% of your checks are wasted. So all you're doing is to kind of this rediscover things that someone else already discovered. And a colleague of mine, Scott Beamer, which I won't use slides because this is actually easier to explain on the board, um, who is now faculty at uh, Santa Cruz, he was supposed to do research on um, architectures, computer architectures for graph processing. He was a student of Dave Patterson um, and Chris Dasanovich. But instead, he discovered that why do people do breadth first search the way they do? Why do they just start from one vertex and keep going forward? And the way he drew it was like, he called it top down. Because you know, we put the roots on the top as computer scientists and go down in the search. He said, why don't they, at this point, switch back the direction? And then from the visit, unvisited vertices, which are those pieces that we haven't seen before yet, reverse the direction of the edges and see if they can find a parent in the frontier. Because that way, I can just early stop. I don't need to check all these edges because if I find one path back, I don't need to check this, meaning that this is discovered. One path back, this is discovered. All these other edges won't need to be touched. So that's actually very powerful and generally makes computation an order of magnitude faster. It's like ridiculous. Um, uh, performance benefit. And then people, of course, expanded this idea to other graph computations because it's not just bread for search. This routine of traversing the graph is used in every other graph algorithm on Earth. So the general name for it is push-pull uh, sometimes. Uh, some people call it direction optimization. Um, but this is, the motivation of this came from looking at the graph and thinking about it. Instead, um, you, you would discover the same algorithm if we had this primitive called sparse matrix vector multiply with a mask. Because, you know, this is almost the same kind of picture that I drew on the board. I think it's more confusing, that's why I drew it. That when you're given a mask that is so sparse, meaning only few entries on the output are allowed, then the right thing for the um, operation to do is to, instead of multiplying, let me actually show it with the matrix for you, okay? When the mask is so sparse, that says there is few entries on the output that are allowed, the right thing to do is what's on the left. So you would, let me see if my mouse is actually showing. No, it's not, okay. <laughs> um, in which case, maybe this will show. Okay. So if there are so few entries, instead of going over the sparse matrix, and then figuring out what entries are allowed, I would just say, hey, can any of these rows create me an output? So I won't touch any other row that's over there. 
and imagine this mask was you know, only 25% full, then I would be touching that, that small piece. And not only that, as soon as I find one non-zero in the output, let's say I'm going over this row, and I find one little non-zero, I don't need to see the rest of the row because I found one parent, so I don't need any other parent for this algorithm to be correct. So these are like um, the early stop and uh, switching the directions from row-based to column-based algorithm um, without knowing what it's doing, like without understanding a graph concept, without understanding semantics. Um, the library writer would write and discover the pull-push optimization purely from the input. They would say, okay, the fast way to compute this thing is to do this. I don't understand graphs. I only know about a function that I need to write that has sparse matrices in it. So I found it really an interestingly good property. Um, and people have exploited this thing, actually. Um, we wrote this as a, as a paper quickly, and people in the compiler community that write compilers for graph processing and other things, uh, and machine learning as well. Um, these are Saman uh, Amarasingh's group at MIT. They use this uh, observation to write their compilers um, and transform the code. So I talked to you about breadth first search, but in the end, when you implement it in Graph Plus, there's this lots of boilerplate because of C. You have to declare variables and then uh, you know, initialize them and so on. That doesn't exist in Pythons and any other language. The real code is just two lines. There is a, there is a loop. While there is some variable left to process, it just does this matrix vector multiply that I talked to you about with the masked and of parents input sparse matrix as the adjacency matrix, input vector as the previous frontier, and just applies, uh, the GRB apply just sets the output to the parents array that I described. The variable names are again C-like, so don't worry about it, but it executes, at least it's the code that runs. Now I'm gonna talk about one more um, example that shows this, and it's one of my favorite examples to talk about randomized algorithms and graphs. You might have heard about this. So a fundamental problem in graphs is to compute an independent set. An ind independent set is just a set of vertices in a graph that are not neighbors of each other. This is used a lot in, when choosing um, vertices for aggregation in multi-level algorithms. can be used for parallelism because you can execute things on vertices that are not neighbors of each other, and so on. And a maximal independent set is just simply an independent set that cannot be increased by adding another vertex. It's not maximum in the sense that uh, there might be a larger independent set. It's like a local minimum, local maximum you got stuck on. But it's usually much more useful because the other one is NP-complete and this one is fairly easy to compute. Um, the simple algorithm to do that is, is just, you know, go over all the uh, vertices and we'll do this in fairly um, quick time. So is that the randomized algorithm? The, the problem with the uh, parallelization of the greedy algorithm that just goes over all the vertices is it's sequential in nature. And how can you compute this thing fast, um, almost linear time, not quite? It's a very simple randomized algorithm. Every Vertex tosses a random number, whatever range, zero to one, and then they look at their neighbors. And if they are smaller than their neighbors, they consider themselves as the, the part of the independent set. Okay? And um, so what does it take? Let's, let's toss some numbers, and everybody looks at their neighbors, and one and five will discover that they are part of the independent set, and they will um, put themselves in the independent set, they will take out themselves as well as their, their neighbors out of consideration because their neighbors cannot be anymore in any independent set either. Right? So what's left with is the C, which is the remaining candidate set, 6 and 8, and 6 and 8 will play this game again in the next iteration of tossing numbers and looking at each other. And then, of course, eventually there will be nothing left, and that's your maximal independent set. This will very high probability... Um, and in logarithmic steps, in the worst case. And um, so it's almost, almost good as linear time work. It's not quite linear time, but pretty close. 
And generally, that's what people run. This is attributed to, well, not attributed to, this is Michael Luby's algorithm, um, who went on to have a distinguished career in other areas like error correcting codes and so on. Um, but if you write this in graph plus, again, what are we doing here? All we're doing is we're looking at our neighbor's information and gathering that information, right? And that's how we decide whether we're gonna be part of the independent set. This whole gathering your neighbor's thing is again, sparse matrix times vector. The vector is every vertex is random numbers and gathering part is just multiplication. So the same thing happens. Initially, the vector will be dense because everybody will be in the candidate set, but after the initial iteration, the vector will be sparse because people will take themselves out of the candidate set. So you'll just see that in a loop, there's multiple sparse matrix vector multiplies, almost always with the sparse vectors. One just uh, gathers people's uh, random numbers. The second one just broadcasts people to delete themselves. Hey, you're done kind of thing. And this again in graph plus is actually uh, easily represented. Again, apologies for the, the boilerplates in C. So that was pattern one. Pattern two is, is pretty easy to, because all it is doing is generalizing the sparse vector case to multiple vector case, where it becomes sparse matrix. And if you have an algorithm that traverses the graph from multiple starting vertices, then then the sparse matrix, sparse vector, will become sparse matrix, sparse matrix. And where does this happen? Well, it happens in between a centrality, for example. It happens in macro clustering that I'm gonna talk about later. And any other algorithm that tolerate simultaneous operations, like say, simultaneous breadth first search. Um, and the, the picture there is really the same picture, except there's multiple columns. So I don't need to give um, too much generalization. That's why I'm not gonna go over the between a centrality example. Um, but it has more parallelism, and usually if your algorithm tolerates simultaneous searches, it's much better to ex uh, execute it that way. But I'm gonna talk about just a tiny little um, other application, um, which is counting motifs. This algorithm actually does uh, count more motifs than triangles, but the triangle is the easiest one to explain. So people have seem to be have an obsession with counting triangles. Um, this algorithm will actually enumerate them as well if you keep a vector as opposed to a scalar. It's just more painful to implement in parallel, but uh, theoretically it's, it's, it's quite trivial. You just need to change the, again, the semi-ring operations. The multiplications will become appends into the list, right? So then, then it's gonna do the enumeration as opposed to counting. Um, so this whole idea, let me see how many, uh, let me, I think I reordered this thing, slides. The idea to count triangles with this algorithm is how do I you know, index a triangle? And uh, I think this is based on Cohen's algorithm. I think this is folklorish, but the Cohen published it first. We're gonna um, index each triangle with the lowest vertex ID uh, it has. That's called the little hinge there. Um, so, and then that means we're gonna have an ordering of vertices first. Let's assume you did the ordering, and if you do orderings differently, the result is correct, but if you order the vertices um, with uh, increasing degree, the algorithm will be faster um, by the simple observation that if you had a high degree vertex as your hinge, um, then you're in trouble because there's gonna be a lot of triangles to enumerate around it. So the algorithm will run faster if you um, count it differently. But it's not the material to the result. The, the whole idea is, how can I create um, the triangle counting in matrix form? I'm gonna cut my matrix into two pieces. This is not factorization. This is just A equals L plus U. Okay, I'm just you know creating two matrices, cutting them on the diagonal. And what is L doing? L is really all the vertices who are, uh, oh sorry, all the edges from a high numbered vertex to a low numbered vertex, and U is the opposite, from a low numbered vertex to a high numbered vertex. When I multiply L and U, I am basically creating, enumerating all the, uh, the wedges of the form I want to count, which is at the bottom there, where the low degree vertex is the hinge. I'm not counting every triangle six times, I'm only counting every triangle actually twice here, 
So it seems to be good. There is a better algorithm that's going to count every one of them once. But let's not get there. I, I created all the, the wedges by multiplying L and U. Uh, the wedge is just the unclosed triangle. Uh, and then I'm going to check if it creates a triangle by doing an element-wise uh, you know, Hadamard product with the original matrix. If there is a closing edge, that means I have a triangle. And if there is, um, and the number of triangles will be number of wedges uh, if there is a closing edge. So all I need to do is to sum up the values in C to get the total tri triangle count. I can sum up the rows of C or columns of C to get local triangle counts, meaning all the triangles that are uh, part of a single vertex. So uh, you can do a lot of things in this. And you can enumerate them. Instead of getting counts, you can just list them. Um, but what's the catch? Well, the catch is, again, why we introduce masks. Actually, this was the first thing that made us introduce masks. It turns out that the number of wedges, unclosed triangles, can be an order of magnitude more than the actual number of triangles. It makes sense, right? Um, it, in some graphs, it is actually the de almost the definition of uh, clustering coefficient, pretty close. Um, so why would one want to enumerate all of these things um, if all you want is the triangles? And that brings you the, the whole idea of the mask. So instead of executing these things in line by line and creating B that is 10 times larger than the output, you're just going to um, pass A, the original matrix, adjacency matrix, as your mask and tell the system, please don't compute any wedges if there is no closing edge. So, and that's going to compute the right thing without extra memory and without extra time. Now, what is the right algorithm to do a masked sparse time sparse matrix? That's, that's the second part of the talk. Uh, that's also a tricky algorithm to come up with. But again, in graph plus, that's just um, a single line of actual useful code. Everything else is a bunch of free and declaration codes. So the, the whole power of this algorithm is in, in a single line of matrix multiply. And you can do K-tras, you can do rectangles. I'm just giving you the simplest example. Um, so I am actually pretty efficient about where I'm going. So do, do we have questions so far? Yes. Do, do we need microphones? Or? I'm coming to you. Where is the question? It's interesting. It's mostly the people at the top of the amphitheater who have questions, but that's good exercise for me. No, no, you have to come further. Uh, well, this is a, a great talk so far, so I don't want to derail too much. I was just wondering about the, um, the, uh, sorry, the semi ring. Mm -hmm. How is that like specified? Is it is it like function pointers, or is there a fixed list? And I guess where I'm getting at is, uh, do you optimize? You must be doing like optimizations on these primitives based on the semi-ring, right? Yeah. Well, uh, that you're, you're pointing to, a, again, a sore point of discussion that has been going in this you know, painful process. In C, it's a function pointer. Of course, once you realize that, you're wasting all your time calling functions. Um, we have been adding more and more commonly used semi-rings to what we consider as built-in semi-rings. So the, the library implements them in a separate file, so you don't declare it, so there is no function to call, there is no penalty for function call. Uh, but that's not ideal, because you can't just foresee every single useful semi-ring use case. Um, C++ will solve these issues, uh, and we're actually almost there with C++. But so far, the, the method works is we come up with different semi-rings that we show usefulness in algorithms, and and then they become eventually built-in semi-rings, uh, which not great, but C. <laughs> All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So I feel like I can just go on, but instead, I think it's to everybody's interest to have a little bit of break in these things. Um, so I, I, I put. I said this is a, not a bad time to have a break, but if you think it's too early, I can talk about biology first and then take a break too. What do you think? Please, I think you can continue. I'll, with, uh, I'll make, hmm? Uh, no, I think we, you can move to the first application. Okay, let's, let's go on to another application. Actually, grass was one. So let's postpone this break to after the biology. Yes. 
Yes, then we because, have a bio break. Yeah, bio break and whatever you want to do. Um, so this might actually take longer because this is actual science. <laughs> um, it's kind of a joke that uh, one of my colleagues, now a professor at UIUC, said when he was a grad student, he was like, uh, gonna present his poster, and on the, on the top there was the motivational part, and the bottom is the, the computer science part, he, he of course was proud of. And he just basically, you know, was bored of repeating the same thing on over, over again towards the end of the poster session said, well, this top part is just, that's science. Let's not worry about it. <laughs> Let's just talk about how, how I compute this thing. <laughs> so, but science is fun because you can tell it to your grandma and it makes sense a little bit. Um, and no offense to some people's grandmas are professors and smarter than everybody around. So uh, I'm just talking about mine. No offense. So um, genome assembly. Let's um, talk about how people actually assemble genomes. Um, when your genome is sequenced from a sequencer, you get um, pieces of DNA that are significantly shorter than your genome because that's just how the technology is. Um, there are older, so-called older technology, which is um, gonna give you really high throughput output, but really small DNA pieces, 150 base pairs. That's the Illumina company is the name. Um, Illumina will give you um, really cheap reads that are significantly shorter than what you can make good sense of for at least complex genomes. Uh, there's newer technologies, where, um, that, which is actually what I'm gonna talk about, that give you significantly lo longer reads. Let's say 20,000 base pairs. Again, your genome is more than three billion base pairs, so you can put this in perspective, still how small and how fragmented this output is. Uh, but you know, if, if I told the biologist that they would get 20,000 base pairs a decade ago, they would be like, wow, this is amazing. They call these long reads. Um, so the process of building, and there's many algorithms, of course. It seems like the most popular way of uh, building um, the genome is to create something called an overlap graph. An overlap graph f first creates the all non-trivial overlaps between so-called reads. These DNA sequences coming from the assembler are called reads for historical reasons. Um, and you have to f essentially compare all to all of all of these. But I'm gonna tell you how you can avoid the all to all. Um, but they know it, it's not that I'm, I discovered this thing. But in the process of explaining why sparse matrix can be used, you, I'll also tell you that. Um, and once you have these overlaps, then there'll be a lot of redundant edges because you know, the, the genome is usually sequenced at a uh, coverage that's larger than two, three, right? You, you try to cover the genome by a factor of 10 to 20, depending on the quality. In the old days, they used to cover it 70 times because of the short reads. Nowadays, you can get away with 20, 10. And if, you, if you're wondering why this is the case, think of, a, the, I didn't include the analogy piece. The analogy is you're solving a puzzle, right? Um, you're given a puzzle, and except there's a couple of issues with the puzzle. You don't have the picture that's on the back of the puzzle. The puzzle is very hard with all the repetitions. Um, and the same piece goes everywhere else. So it's not a solvable puzzle for all practical purposes, except that you're given 10 copies of the same puzzle cut in different places. So this way you can just kind of go to the second puzzle and say, oh yeah, this must be there. Or the other analogy is book analogy. You're given the, the Moby Dick uh, book shredded into pieces, except you don't know how these things come together and you don't know English, actually. Like, because you, you, and, uh, right now we have the context. It makes sense to, to put things together if they seem to form a sentence. But in DNA, what do you say? Like, G's should come more often than A? Yes, there is some statistics there, but nobody uses it for assembly. So you need multiple copies of the book shredded in different parts so you can overlap them. Um, and get some coverage. And then you eliminate the redundant edges, as we call it the transitive reduction. And then finally you can generate things called contexts, which are unambiguous DNA sequences that are significantly, ideally, significantly longer than your input size. And from then on, you're almost done. You just do a couple of uh, scaffolding I'm not gonna talk about. So that's the whole pipeline. Uh, there's polishing steps and so on. That's uh, a little bit, uh, too involved. Um, 
So we had this overlapper, which, because the overlapping step of finding overlaps between reads were the most computationally demanding part. Um, and it still is. And this is kind of based on something called the KMERS. Everybody's uh, assembler is based on KMERS. KMERS are just a nucleotides of length K, usually consecutive. Sometimes there, there's gapped KMERS and so on. And that becomes your number one feature when you're assembling things. And it comes from Greek, I think. Meris is piece like KMERS. Um, I don't know Greek, but that's what I've been told. Um, so I'm going to show you how actually uh, this works in sparse matrices. Very simple pictures. Let's say you have this matrix where the rows are the reads, your input, and you found all the cameras you're interested in. You can choose your cameras any way you like. You can say, I'm going to keep all the cameras in the input. You can say, I'm going to subsample the cameras based on some sophisticated scheme. Um, or you can do what we do, which is I'm going to choose my cameras based on some unsophisticated scheme. Uh, doesn't matter. You have cameras. These are your features. And if you multiplied this matrix on the left, A, um, which is KMERS by reads with, an, with itself, it's transpose, sorry, what you will get is a reads by reads matrix, naturally, which will say there is a non-zero whenever that read shares a KMER with, with the other read. If they share the same KMER, they will have a non-zero. If they don't, they won't. Now, why is this important? If I choose my case size appropriately, I can statistically show that um, if two reads do not share a KMER, their chances of overlapping is close to zero. Right? That's, that's just basic probability. You can run these things. And that's what we do to choose the length of the K. Um, so once, once I know that, then I will only go over the non-zeros of the output and, and compare them. So I won't do an all-to-all comparison anymore. I'm only going to compare reads that share KMERS, because otherwise there's chances of overlapping is statistically zero. And that's just really every assembler does this. But what I found beauty here is just it actually maps to sparse matrix matrix multiply trivially, except you need a semi-ring. And in, in this semi-ring, it's actually a little complicated. It's not just counting the numbers. I also want to know exactly where these KMERS occur that are shared between two reads. Because blindly comparing two reads of 20,000 base pairs is very expensive. It's a quadratic algorithm. So it's the, you know, Simit Waterman uh, is the most canonical name of it. So you don't want to be doing quadratic time thing on 20,000 inputs for many, many pieces. Instead, if I know exactly where the KMERS occurs that are shared, I'm kinda, I, I can do a so-called an extent, see the extent around that area, and then quickly test whether this alignment is correct or not. So I need to keep track of the location of the read. For that, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just basically going to abuse the semi-ring thing, and it's going to propagate me the information of the locations on the reads. So all I'm doing is just overloading multiplication and addition once again. And that works fine. And here is the actual power. It's not just a mathematical exercise of being able to map to something to something else, which is beautiful on its own. But we have code that runs on you know, tens of thousands of processors successfully. Um, when I say processors, I mean cores, but this is nodes. So these days, the, the definition gets a little murky. Um, we're just able to scale this code without writing any parallel code. We, all we do is, oh, this is how we, we should do it. And then going from the sequential code to parallel code is mostly glue, because we already have fast sparse matrix matrix multiply codes written for distributed memory from the decades of research we and others have done. So it just creates your parallel code almost automatically. And this, this code includes the transitive reductions phase as well, which is another matrix matrix multiply kind of process, which I am surprisingly not covering. Um, but it's a fairly simple algorithm. You can just, you know, take one step and see if one of your edges is transitive. It's actually, um, it's described in this paper. But what is the benefit compared to writing your code? Well, first of all, uh, we had a not-so-controlled experiment on this because different students wrote these pieces. 
Before we identified this connection, um, we first wrote a version of this overlapper using distributed hash tables. So what, we took a while, and it's um, lots of bugs, lots of, um, actually years of effort has gone to it to create a correct and scalable version, which, you know, it was scalable, as you can see, the, that's what we call the Debella 1D. And the Debella 2D, once we've identified the sparse matrix connection, was written in uh, weeks of effort as opposed to years, and scaled just as well, and in fact, faster across all concurrencies. So that was, again, not a controlled experiment, different people write different pieces, but I think it's very um, convincing argument to discover primitives and reuse them over and over again for productivity and performance. So in, in short, the whole process really looks like this. This is for completeness. For those who like genome assembly, um, you find k-mers based, based on that uh, histograms. You choose some of your favorite k-mers. You build a sparse matrix from your reads and k-mers. You do overlapping with sparse matrix operations, like I described AA transpose. You're going to do expensive alignments for those that are in the non-zeros of the output. You do transitive reduction, which is really just, you know, square the i matrix and see if there is a transitive edge. This is element-wise Hadamard product uh, with the original one, and keep doing this until there is no more edges to be transitively reduced. And then the context generation step doesn't seem to map well to sparse matrices, but it's fun to, it was fun to develop algorithms for it too which are just going to be presented somewhere in a couple of weeks, a couple of months, maybe. So that's my first biology application. Um, the second one is going to come sound pretty similar, but um, it's actually used for very different purposes. Um, so far, any questions on the genome assembly? I don't see any. Okay. This is, again, on this software engineering thing, because you say we have lots of parallel code that already exists, but now if you want to change the multiplication, for instance, or things like that, uh, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Can you reuse that code? Oh, yeah. Or? That's the beauty, right? I mean, that's, that is not... You just change the, uh, the function you're passing. The interface has addition and multiplication passed as a template parameter in the codes that I developed. Not the, the other one has function pointers, but the ones I've developed are C++. So, so, so this ancient uh, parallel code already was programmed that way? Well, it's, it's as ancient as 15 years. Yeah, it's not that ancient. <laughs> yeah, so yes, I, the whole purpose was uh, to be able to allow those changes. Okay, but um, then I would have a follow-up question. So <clears throat> if you are... I mean, if these uh, primitives are working, let's say, in single or double precision, maybe I agree with you. But if we were, let's say, passing addition multiplication from GMP, where we work in arbitrary precision, maybe, maybe not, no? It does work. The only, I mean, the compiler will just um, compile them to find, yeah, it doesn't matter. You can have arbitrarily complex functions there. Yeah, but that, that, that would change maybe the way of handling data locality. Yes, there is that implication, meaning in, it might change, you know, your cache performance yeah. if you're passing vectors uh, or anything that's not a scalar. Um, but it's going to be correct. Uh, yeah, sure. That's, that's the thing. It will yeah. be correct. Yeah. But maybe the performance won't be optimal anymore. Per performance will probably not be optimal. Um, you might run out of anything, for that matter, yeah. depending on how... How, how much you abuse uh, the, the, the technology. Yeah. Yes, of course. Okay. I mean, okay nothing anyway. actually stops you from even creating a function within that function, but I think it's going to eventually cause significant load imbalance problems to begin with. Yes. Yeah. Okay, very well. Thank you, Annie. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, any um, other question? All right, please, let's continue. Thank you for your patience in uh, staying with me. Um, so this is a problem that came from, again, our genomics colleagues. And it's a very real problem. It's protein families. So these are families of proteins are defined as, you know, a group of proteins that are homologous. Now, that's 
that's another buzzword, right? They evolved from a uh, same ancestor. Uh, so your, our body has hemoglobin that carries blood, um, that carries oxygen, um, right, in our blood to the cells. And it turns out every useful living organism has something like that, right? The soybean has, has an homolog that carries uh, oxygen to its blood. And, but if you looked at the sequences, you would be hard pressed to believe that because it evolved so much that its sequence similarity is to our hemoglobin is like 25%. It's pretty low. Um, but wh why, wh why are we trying to find these things? Okay, there's, there's a lot of good use cases. First, defining the family allows people to discover um, what a newly discovered organism is doing. Like, uh, it probably became very uh, popular with the, uh, the, the pandemic time. People have been doing those things. But I think for my colleagues, what was really interesting is finding families of proteins that doesn't exist in the database. That would mean that they discovered potentially a new um, organism with a functionality they didn't know it existed. So now they can be used for a lot of things in applications in um, biotechnology that I don't know about. Uh, but the simple thing you can think of it is if something breaks down sugar in plants much, much faster, then you can use it for biofuels. Just one example. So they, they care about finding these things. And um, you can define, discover homology from the sequence or the structure. Ideally, these are, of course, neither one of them is perfect. Structure is scarce. Um, it's expensive to do X-ray crystallography on proteins and look at their structures. So there's, um, I would say, less than 1% of the world's proteins are uh, you know, uh, imaged that way. Sequence, getting sequence is much cheaper. So almost every protein people get their hands on has some sort of sequence. Um, it's not directly sequenced from the protein. They just find the genes on the, uh, on the genome and then translate into protein, which is a, a you know, trivial mechanism. So we have lots of sequence, and the process to find this turns out you first, again, like an all-to-all, -all, compare all of them, like in the genome assembly, and find, uh, put an edge if they seem to be somewhat related. And then you run a graph-based clustering algorithm. In this case, I'm using the word SIPMCL, but uh, um, it's a Markov cluster algorithm, different implementation our group has done. Uh, and I'm just using the words PASTIS and HIPMCL because these are what we develop, but there's a million different codes that do these different steps um, because they're, you know, uh, the backbone of a lot of uh, work that's been done in here. And a new tool gets built every two years, and uh, it's a pretty important area. So we call the first step is really the construction of this thing, similarity network construction. Um, and let's see how it can be done. This is very similar to the Bella work I described for genome assembly, except that there is this reality here that the signal in genome assembly was I'm finding identical portions because I'm sequencing the same genome, and if two reads were overlapping, that means that overlapping section needs to be identical up to the sequencing errors. So it's a much stronger signal that I was trying to detect. Here, I am trying to find uh, similarities that have been evolved over, you know, uh, millennials of millions of years. So the signal is much weaker. If I was looking for exact k-mers, even if I choose my size k to be as small as seven, I would actually miss a lot of potentially homologous proteins. So what can I do? Well, first I choose my k to be pretty small. But that's not usually enough. The second thing I do is, I, for each k that I use as my uh, so-called feature, I create a certain number of substitute k or similar k Like, evolutionarily speaking, how would this k evolve to something similar? And I don't just randomly mutate the sequences. I use what biologists have painstakingly created these matrices based on their observations of evolution on protein sequences. So all this is saying is the, the you know, these are inversely correlated to the probability of a, uh, a letter 
and amino acid um, residue changing to another one. So if it's really high, like four, minus four, it, uh, it means there is a huge penalty of from going W to N. But if it's like um, zero or one or two, that means it's very common. K often became R, and that's okay. That kind of stuff. Right? These are like penalty costs. And you can use this matrix to create similar proteins. It's a nice algorithm um, that we wrote. Um, but that's not the interesting part. Once you create that, you can encode that information into an extra matrix, what we call S. This S maps all the k-mers that we found in our input, k is three in this example, to their substitute k-mers. And uh, the non-zeros, which are like just squares here, they will constitute the actual cost. So you can use that in your multiplication to set some sort of filter. Uh, you know, if it's higher than a threshold, return them, otherwise don't. And with this extra matrix, I can just convert my AA transpose operation that I had for genome assembly to ASA transpose, and we'll find for each protein sequence, not only the other sequences that share an exact camer, but also share a substitute camer. And, and of course, for that, I need to write a different semi-ring, which we did. That's nice. Um, and it was scaling pretty good. Um, this is old data from two years ago. Um, and it, it, it was getting faster with the number of nodes. Again, all we did was reuse code. We, we did write new code to generate the substitute gamers, the, the set for each AAA. We had to figure out which are the substitutes. Of course, we wrote code for that and new algorithms. And we wrote some code to parse protein sequences. But the whole computation of here is really reusing code that I described before. And it turned out it wasn't actually bad, accuracy-wise. So this is precision recall, ROC curve, and different variants of pastis is somewhere over here, the red lines here. So it's almost Pareto optimal with the best codes out there. You could argue that last is op better, but last is really, there's no parallel version. So it was not able to run large stuff. Um, so here you want to be, you know, to the right, up and right. Um, high precision and high recall. So what did change um, since, uh, two years ago when this got published, we said, well, we optimized this code a lot, removed a lot of uh, bottlenecks in terms of its memory consumption, uh, in terms of its load balance, uh, started taking advantage of the symmetry of the output, and that created more imbalance that we had to fix again. And then we said, well, these results are actually fairly interesting that we were able to find similarities between proteins that people weren't able to do before. So why don't we submit this to this thing called the ACM Gordon Bell Prize? If you have heard about this, um, it's fine. If you haven't, it is people call it the, I mean, that's the biggest award we have in supercomputing, right? That's set up by um, the Gordon Bell, who's um, sponsored this. I don't know if he's still sponsoring it. It just basically shows a substantial improvement using supercomputing on a real impactful application. And I just learned this morning that we were chosen as a finalist, so that's why I'm putting this. I, I'm, thank you. Um, so we'll see if we were chosen. Every finalist you know, gets to present and become part of the proceedings, but you're not, you don't know if you're gonna win it until November, somehow. Um, and that was the, um, the abstract. So we were able to run this thing on over 12,000 GPUs with um, almost um, one-third of a billion proteins. <coughs> um, I have one little thing before the break, which is, well, I created this similarity graph, but I haven't gotten protein families because what it turns out is um, the, the signal is so weak, I will only get edges sometimes and you can, you can believe that you're doing math by probability, that sometimes you will um, catch weak signals, sometimes you won't, and it's much easier to actually find distant ancestors by going two hops away, meaning my hemoglobin, it's really hard to get a signal to the soybean's hemoglobin, but I can get a signal 
to my ancestor, and my ancestor can get a signal to, you know, its ancestor, and it, it can get a signal to, um, to the soybeans hemoglobin, right? So we're not, I'm not directly similar enough to catch that signal, but if, if I go through three couple of hops on the graph, I can catch that signal. So how do I, that, what does it make sense? I can just use a graph clustering algorithm to define the proteins, and that actually seems to be the state of the art in this business. People like the results in biology, uh, and you know, the, the Markov clustering algorithm, whose picture I showed at the bottom, which essentially just pushes probabilities to its neighbors. So uh, uh, it's like a, a random walk from every starting vertex kind of process until convergence. Uh, with, with process in the middle to make sure that the graph stays sparse as opposed, to, because if you just do a random walk, the probability will be everywhere and it's not gonna be useful. But at every step, you can kind of uh, prune the low probability edges and amplify the high probability edges and repeatedly do that, it converges to the clusters. And you can extract those clusters by just doing connected components at the end. And this is a very popular algorithm with, I don't know, 5,000 citations now, I think. Um, widely used, but people wanted to use it for larger data sets, and um, it was only a, a single node implementation. Again, this is just what I'm describing. F random walks will get trapped, and that's what's gonna define clusters, makes sense. Um, so we had to, it was our job to, to create a large-scale distributed memory version. And the first thing we noticed is there are two extremes you can go about this. The main computation is just squaring the matrix. Squaring the matrix is one step, the, it's called the expansion. And then once you do that, you inflate the high probabilities by just element-wise, taking element-wise powers of everything to usually two, but you can take it to element-wise power to any number. That kind of amplifies high entries and dampens small ones. Just imagine you have 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, uh, that are the outgoing connections for a vertex, which is gonna be a column here. And if I just, um, so right now the larger one is eight times the smaller ones, but if I take squares of everything um, and renormalize, now the, uh, the, the large one will be significantly larger than the other, no longer eight times more, but whatever. Um, uh, you can do the math uh, in that business, I think, 64 times more. <laughs> All right, so, um, so what does it say? Uh, I do expand and I do inflate and I prune to make sure that the thing stays sparse. The trouble with the original algorithm um, was it's implemented as a one column at a time. They would do one column and throw away, do it the other column. That's great for memory because you're keeping the memory cost small as possible you create extra vertices, uh, extra edges, or uh, in the graph sense, extra non-zeros in each column, and then uh, delete them before you go to the next column. However, um, that doesn't expose any parallelism because you're doing one column at a time. I mean, there's a little bit of it, but not enough. But if you do the expansion on the whole matrix, which square the matrix, create a temporary A squared, and then prune after that, inflate and prune. That's the maximum amount of parallelism, except that you're gonna run out of memory. <laughs> it's actually so bad that um, if you had a regular matrix, like uniformly random uh, distribution of non-zeros, if you had a, a thousand non-zeros in each column, you would have a million non-zeros in the output, assuming the matrix is big, right? Except that things are not uniform and it's worse. If you have a high degree vertex, you'll get really dense matrices in the output. So, um, so the R algorithm, HIP-MCL, does something in the middle. It looks at the expected number of non-zeros in the output and looks at the available memory it has in the whole allocation. This is all using already the parallel sparse matrices, but it's optimizing for maximum amount of parallelism without running out of memory. So there's a certain number of columns at a time. This has communication implications. Uh, you rebroadcast A over and over again, but at least people get their answers. Um, and that was a nice work. Use a similar algorithm. This got published in a, um, in a nice 
genome um, journal called Nucleic Acid Research a couple years ago. Um, from a computer science perspective, there's not much innovation we've done other than uh, those things, but people seem to have liked it more than any other computer science paper I wrote before. So that's the down upside of working with scientists. Um, the downside is the hours of days and weeks uh, or months that you spend learning about the problem, right? So anyway, we were able to cluster really huge graphs using HIP-MCL, and I'm just gonna close the biology section by, again, giving a recap of how we do protein uh, family detection with sparse matrices. So we use two tools that we develop for this, PASTIS and HIP-MCL. Again, it starts with creating KMER histograms and KMER analysis. Just chop the protein sequences into small case. Um, you will have to uh, create a, uh, usually a similarity matrix uh, as well, in addition to proteins by KMERs. And then you'll do overlapping using, again, sparse matrix matrix multiply. If I haven't used that acronym, SPGEM is the acronym for sparse matrix times sparse matrix. So it's really just AA transpose, or for this case, more often use ASA transpose. We do very similar pairwise alignment filtering, like in the genome assembly case. And the, the pruning is really matrix squares. After that, you do a pruning, but I didn't tell the optimal choice of the number of columns there. So you can see that different problems actually map to various different, very similar workflows um, in this one as well. And this c concludes the part of computational biology. I will um, continue after um, a bio break. So I think 10 minutes is fine, 5.30. Uh, well, sorry, any questions on this, this part? Questions? De la repart, the upper part, les élèves du fond de la classe. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, very well. So we have a little break and we resume at half past. <laughs>